Dear friends in Christ, it's a great joy for me to greet you and to spend some time reflecting on our life together. Cynthia and I together would uh, like to thank you for your constant care, your prayers, and your kindness. And especially across this last year, when uh, we've had a number of significant losses in our family. <laughs> yeah. So it's okay. No, it's okay, honey. Yeah. Sometimes you just got to cry it out. And so I want to say at every turn, the staff of the conference, the cabinet, the Episcopacy Committee has been there. A call, a card, flowers, food, coupons. So we could not be more grateful. So thank you ever so much, uh, Valerie, and to the committee, and to all of our staff, and to all of you who are the annual conference, we're grateful. I think you've heard me say that in the moments in which uh, probably everybody says, uh, you can take this job and shove it. And anybody that says they've never said that, I would not trust them much. I, I don't say it often, but once or twice a year, I have a day. And then I think how oh, God has privileged me. On the days in which uh, I say, if you just gave me a better conference, and the Holy Spirit says, any conference you have is more than you deserve. I've tried to communicate that to the clergy of this conference. Any church you have is more than you deserve. This is not work we're entitled to. It's work we've been gifted with. So thanks be to God for the gospel, for the church, and for you. Thank you for a good annual conference so far. And I want to say to all of you, you are to be congratulated on all the ways across these last two and a half years that you have chosen, you have chosen not to waste the crises created by multiple pandemics. You have in the main chosen to live and to thrive rather than to wilt and to die. The capacity to make conscious, meaningful, and thoughtful choices are the difference between those persons and those congregations and those institutions that will continue to have life. And frankly, the pandemics notwithstanding, those are the choices that we are all needing to make all the time. What will make for life? What will give us a sense of buoyancy? What will keep us out of the doldrums and out of the funk and keep our eyes on Jesus Christ? I want to offer another way of saying uh, a couple of things to you. Uh, I don't want to make too much of this, but it occurs to me that in about 25 months, I will have done all I can do. And so I think often, not about how I can get to the finish line faster, but what I want to accomplish. But more than quantifying it or coming up with a list of things that need to be accomplished, I've been forced to think about, rightly so, who I want to be and how I want to function. I said to the Episcopacy Committee, several years ago that I saw myself moving forward 
in four modalities, each with two foci, but not in contradiction to one another, though they could be seen that way, but in creative tension with one another. Listen to what I said to them in 20 and 16. I said, I see myself in my ministry as both an evangelist and a prophet. And if you are a United Methodist, there is no separation between the Evangelion, the good news of Jesus Christ to be proclaimed, and the work of prophetic transformational leadership. So I see myself not as one or the other, not categorized as traditionalist or progressive, liberal or conservative, left or right, Democrat or Republican. I see myself as an evangelist and a prophet. I see myself, secondly, as a provocateur and a healer. I am called to stir some things up, and I am called to bind up the wounds of the brokenhearted and to bind up the wounds of the church. Thirdly, I see myself as a curator and a creator. There are some things that need to, to be preserved and perhaps some things set aside and left for the annals of history. But there is also work for all of us to do all the time in creating, shaping, and fashioning the new thing that is emerging not out of us, but out of the triune God, who it says in Scripture is making all things new. And I see myself, and I believe this to be true of anybody that assumes the uh, mantle of trying to be an effective leader, that we must always be both leaders and followers. There's not much point in me announcing how great a leader I want to be or I think I am if there is no followership on my part. I start my life and everything else grows out of my discipleship and my following after Jesus. That said, we are now called to give some thought to how we see ourselves and who we choose to be. I was struck in the last couple of years by a book that came out in 2017 by a familiar author, Margaret Wheatley, a book entitled, Who Do We Choose to Be? Question mark, facing reality, claiming leadership, and restoring sanity. I'm not sure that the question raised by this book title could be more aligned with our theme of becoming. Think about it, becoming. It does not yet appear what we shall be. Think about the alignment with the question raised in the title of her book. Who do we choose to be? Think of it as a Christian. Think of it as a leader. Think of it as a member of West Ohio. Think of it as a United Methodist. We are in that trysting place and at that pivot and turning moment where we must answer the question, who we choose to be. I did not say... We have to answer structural questions. We are called to answer questions, not so much of doing, but of being, because any of our doing that does not grow out of our being will ultimately fall flat on its face. And we will be beating our voices and our winds against the firmament, becoming. We've said for these three days, we want to be the people who think about what it means to become spirit-filled, what it means to become community, what it means to become like Jesus. So I ask you, who do you choose to be? You can respond to the question in the personal. We should be responding to the question in the communal, as the church, as the United Methodist Church, as an annual conference, as local congregations, who do we choose to be? What reality, to play upon Wheatley's title, are we facing? What leadership are we claiming? And what sanity are we attempting to restore to a world that seems to have, seems to have gone mad? Who do you choose to be? I like this question because it takes us down to the roots of what I think are the, is the fundamental question of our lives, and those happen to be identity questions. 
You heard me some years ago tell you a story which I'll not rehearse here, but you can look at the video sometime. A scene in the movie entitled A Soldier Story, which was also a play which every now and again comes back to Broadway, in which there is a confrontation in a mess hall in a base, an army base camp during World War II. A young buck private and a sergeant get into a tussle. Others try to come to the buck private's defense. And the buck private, through his stammering English, says to those who are trying to defend him, and I quote now, I know who I is. The grammar may not be exactly right. The conjugation of the verb to be may not be exactly right. But the question is unmistakable and his declaration is unmistakable. I know who I is and that's the question that you and I as United Methodists are being confronted with in this hour. Do we know who he is? That's the question that Christians are being confronted with in this hour where at least the institutional church is more than in declining importance and significance. Do we know who we is? Perhaps nobody is paying attention to us in the ways that we think or hope that they would because we're not acting and living like we know who we is. So who are you? And where are you going? And how will your actions grow out of an affirmative response to the question, who do you choose to be? The Bible is laced from beginning to end with questions and narratives that I believe are fundamentally about identity. I, I snagged just a half dozen or so of them. In Exodus 13 and 3 and Exodus 20 and 2, there is this word that is always about identity and the call to identity to ancient Israel often began with the words, remember. Remember. Remember the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Remember, remember, remember. We will never know who we are if we lose sight of who we have been, but more importantly, who God has called us to be. It is in the remembering that we can be remembered in the midst of our chaos. Oh, listen to this one in the Shema in Deuteronomy in 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. It is a declaration of identity about not only saying who we understand God to be, but who we understand ourselves to be in the light and the countenance of the living God. Or if you come to the Gospels, the narratives of temptation in the synoptics, what's going on there? Is it really about jumping off of pinnacles? Is it really about turning stones into bread? No, it is primarily about Jesus claiming his identity fully and unalterably, which ultimately leads him to the cross. This tension, this chaos, this uncertainty perhaps that attempts to be created by this provocateur voice that comes and said, comes and says, you know, if thou be the son of God. Well, if somebody questions your fundamental identity, you are potentially in an identity crisis if you do not have a clear response. But in every case, Jesus said to what the adversary said when he said it is written, and Jesus said it is also written. Who are you? Do you know your story? It's that story about your having come through trials, tribulation, tests, and temptations. Has your faith and your praxis been put to the test in the real world? Or listen to this in John's gospel. I love this in chapter 1, beginning at verse 35, when John the Baptist is sort of giving a handoff, there's this wonderful identity kind of conversation. Jesus senses a couple of the disciples or those who will become disciples following after him. And he turns around and he asks them this question, what are you looking for? An identity question to which they respond, Rabbi, show us or tell us where you live. And finally, this just as another illustration before I move on. In the Markin text, 
and those words in Mark 8, 27 to 34, but where the question is posed, who do you say that I am after who do others say I am? But you, those closest to me, my disciples, who do you say I am? Because Jesus understood that if they began to get that right, they would understand who they had been called to be. I want to suggest a couple of ways that we can stay clear in the midst of the current storms in which we find ourselves. I have no naivete that we are not in the middle of some chaos, but I also believe with Margaret Wheatley that in the chaos there is often order, but we just cannot see it all. But I believe for a church moving forward, our identity must be clear. It must be rooted in the triune God. Let me be even more specific. We must clearly understand ourselves into the God who has made God self-known in the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let me see if I can say it another way. We must keep Jesus Christ at the center of what we are doing who we say we are. We must be shaped by him, try to be conformed to the image of who he is, aligning ourselves with him, less worried about what people say about us and more worried about what the triune God knows about us. But part of what he knows about us is that God has called us to live fully into being God's beloved children, and we have seen that most distinctly, uniquely, transformatively, and powerfully in, powerfully in the face of Jesus Christ, our Lord. No Jesus, no church. No Jesus, no Christian. No Jesus, no community. It's about Jesus in the morning, Jesus at noonday, and Jesus when the sun goes down. I have a friend in East Ohio, now long retired, who has uh, an adult child that lives here in the West Ohio Conference and serves among us very ably as a lay person. And his favorite hymn, I've never forgotten it, is Ask Ye What Great Thing I Know. That delights and stirs me so. What the high reward I win, who's the name? I glory in Jesus Christ, the crucified. The third verse says, who is life in life to me? Who the death of death will be? Who will place me on his right with the countless hosts of light? Jesus Christ, the crucified. Our life must be shaped and ultimately conform if we are to have true meaning and purpose around who Jesus was, who he is, and who he is inviting us to be. Jesus at the center can have multiple meanings. You can think that it's a call to take a poll. Well, are you on the left side or the right side of Jesus? Or if it's a circle, the point at which you find yourself on the circle, how does it position you in a world that is drunk on ideologies, most of which many people cannot even spell, much less understand? But when their caucus tells them what they believe, then they seem to become wonderfully articulate all of a sudden. Let me be fair. It happens no matter the ideological and theological bent of the caucus. I can always tell when there's something up in the United Methodist Church. Something comes out in a news story. And about 10 days to the day later, I start getting letters on the subject matter that all look alike. And I say sometimes, I guess their caucus told them what they should think about what happened in a certain situation or context. So Jesus at the center has some multiple meanings, but it's not just about are you to the left or the right, but that may be a way of thinking about it. Not that we can know left or right that clearly, or not that any of us are all of one thing. How insane, how insidious for any of us to call ourselves traditional or progressive. About what? I am both. Not because I'm trying to find some center, but I am trying to move to the heart of the matter, which is how do I live my life in community and in conformity with Jesus Christ. 
Bishop Woody White painted a picture about the insidiousness of how we get on these polarities in thinking and talking about who Jesus was and who Jesus is and who Jesus is inviting us to be. It was 1988 in St. Louis, Missouri, may I say to you. First time I was a delegate to the General Conference as a member of the East Ohio Conference delegation. He preached one morning on the stage from the psalmist who said he's turned my morning into dancing. And the title of his sermon was, I Could Have Danced All Night. The sub-theme of it all was how to find joy in God, joy in the Lord, joy in Jesus Christ. But when he came to the Christological moment, help me, Holy Ghost, he said that I'm confused, I struggle, I, I feel sometimes like I'm being battered on either side by my conservative and my liberal friends. And this is what he said. He said, my conservative friends, we might use the word traditional now, act like they own Jesus. I'm quoting somebody else. <laughs> and my liberal friends act like they don't know him. Mm, just let that settle. <laughs> my conservative friends act like they own Jesus. And my liberal friends act like they don't know him. <laughs> May I say to you, it is seductive to conclude and to act as if any of us knows Jesus as fully and completely as we might. We are people in process individually and collectively. I am not saying there are no differences of opinion, there are not multiple angles of view, but sometimes all of the angles are not in contradiction to one another. The viewpoints are not into contradiction to one another. They help us to see who Jesus is more completely and more fully. And then that which we have not taken into ourselves about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus has the possibility of our knowing the influence of that point of view. I am not talking about or calling for any kind of theological or interpretive biblical work that is relativist, but asking that we be delivered from the seduction, which is a sin in my judgment, to fall for the seduction that any of us yet knows Jesus as fully as we might. We amble along, we stumble along, we speak out of conviction, and sometimes we speak out of uncertainty. We take what we know, and then we offer it to the community and to the Holy Spirit and say, God, this is not perfect. Make of it what it can be. Now, may I say to you, it is equally seductive to point to others claiming, claiming that their faith in Jesus Christ is not real or genuine because they have a slightly different vocabulary than you have. Nobody in the West Ohio Conference and in the United Methodist Church needs to surrender Jesus nor surrender the cross. We need to get under the cross and cry out in the cross of Christ, I glory and stand and tarry there and pray there. And while all of us would have hoped that we would be long past having in the rearview mirror the 2020 General Conference and that whatever actions might have taken place would have already taken place, I wonder if God has us standing at the foot of the cross and saying, see me. See me in the wounds of my darling son, who I have healed those wounds and raised from the dead. See in him the faces of all of the people that you and your church have ignored throughout these years. You and your tribe have ignored throughout these years because it was seductive and comfortable for you to be with folks that were just like you. Same zip code as you, same pigment as you, same gender identification as you. Maybe in this time which we would not have dreamed up. We've got an opportunity to stand, to be delivered from the seductions and to gaze upon Jesus Christ, be in conversation in Christian community and discover again that he is at the heart of our lives. So I hope whatever we do, because if we don't do this, it's all irrelevant. In our choosing 
who we will be, that Jesus will be at the center. I can hear a gospel song of mid 20th century. The road is rough, the going gets tough, and the hills are so hard to climb. But I started out a long time ago, and Jesus, <laughs> I've made Jesus my choice. I've made Jesus my choice. Now, here's the second thing. I hope in our choosing who we will be, that we will choose to be church. That we will choose to be community. And that we will choose connection. And I want to give you just a couple of one-liners for you to hang on. I was listening as I was praying the other day in private devotion. I've seen this in writing many times. You've seen it. There's nothing novel about this. You cannot pray the so-called Lord's Prayer without saying our Father. So I don't want to get into the uncomfortability or uncomfortability of the patriarchal language, but I want to focus on the our. There are no first person pronouns in there. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. If there are any there, they're all directed <laughs> toward God. But when we refer to ourselves in that prayer, it's about deliver us. <laughs> hmm? Give who? Us this day our daily bread. So the next time you get to that prayer, and I hope it'll be soon, I hope you'll just get a lump in your throat on our, on the plurality of that, on the we-ness of that. Who is, who's the our? Someone has suggested, some, some, some legitimate New Testament scholar has suggested, aside from the image that we're all siblings of one another, that if this is even a prayer that has something to do, and you have to look at the biblical context with, with addressing how we relate to enemies, that we should be seeing even those we see as enemies and nemesi as people that we are ultimately called to be in community with. Here's another one, Luke 15. Mirosaw Volf, who teaches uh, at Yale Divinity School, previously taught at Fuller Theological Seminary, has a book that I've commended to you entitled Exclusion and Embrace. It's got a subtitle about forgiveness and suffering and all of that. But in looking at the text in Luke 15 about the so-called prodigal son, he says that one way he looks at the son who left to go to the far country, it was as if that son was trying to unsun himself. That he had made his life project to unsun himself. We know that things come back together, but not completely. I hope the story ended better than Jesus left us at the end of the story. Because what we see at the end is the father out there pleading with the other brother who stayed home who can't even refer to his brother as his brother, but says, your son, this son of yours. In those moments, I would argue, he was unhitching or unsunning or unsiblingly or unfamilying himself because he was angry. He was angry that this brother of his would go into the far country, squander his inheritance, which he got in advance of his father's death. And then come home and his dad wouldn't even receive his groveling plea to come back home, but throws him a party. Listen to what he says. All these years, sounds like some folk I know who are saying we're the righteous remnant. Don't fall for the okie doke don't go for the head fake. We're, we're the righteous remnant. And all these years, we've been toiling in this church. Well, it can happen among any of us, our caucuses and our tribes. Don't fall for it. Because when God looks upon us, he sees us ideally as being together. 
Listen to this quote from someone smarter than I. This person says, we don't have peace. This is about the world. You can make it about the church. We don't have peace because we have forgotten that we belong to one another. Hmm. I hope in our choosing who we will be, we will choose to be healers and to be carriers of hope in our communities and in all the places where we find our personal lives and the life of the church, that we will choose healing and hope for a world that is filled with despair and a world that is coming apart at the seams because of our propensity and our addiction to violence, our addiction. We are hooked. We are hooked on violence. This is not about any incidents which recently occurred. You can even start in the Bible that once things got messed up, violent act after violent act after violent act. When will we learn? Our learning curve, the incline is so steep. How will the church be the purveyor of hope and a sign of peace and of redemption and of reconciliation. Who do we choose to be? Do we choose to be healers, hope bearers, peace builders and makers and reconcilers for all of the places where there is despair and hopelessness? Now, I would be utterly living on another planet if I offered no specificity, but I have no program. Program I have is, let's be the church. <laughs> but listen, my friends, if the church continues, and let me say the United Methodist Church, and let me be more specific, the West Ohio Conference, to gaze at our own navels about our internal debates, <laughs> how will we have anything to say to a world where you can get a gun and off a crowd of people before you can shake a stick at it. We're hooked in West Ohio. We are hooked and we are addicted to one conversation. Even with what is front of us in our recommendations and resolutions, none of which I'm agreeing with or disagreeing with, not one of them speaks to the kind of violence I'm talking about here. Not one of them urges me or us to deploy ourselves to Capitol Hill in Columbus and speak into our governor. Some of you can say this is politics if you want. I'm standing with Jesus. And if he's political, I'm political. This is not partisan for me. Don't tune me out because you don't want to understand and believe that ours is the gospel of peace. Either it is or it is not. <laughs> a governor who God loving functioned at a high level to protect us from COVID and some weeks ago signed a concealed carry, no permit law in the state of Ohio. So where will the mass shooting be in Columbus or Dayton or in Zanesville or in some open country place. Uvalde, Texas is not a big metropolis. I'm saying to you, do we have a voice that actually seeks the welfare of the people, that seeks to make the world safe for children, but also for us? Those were almost exclusively adults in the Topps grocery store in Buffalo. You fool, you take the, ac the, the accessibility to weapons and you combine it with hatred and racism and you get a predictable result. My question in the who do we choose to be is, do we choose to be a church that can speak into that? Not because we have words and resolutions, but because we are creating communities formed around Jesus Christ and we choose we choose the path of nonviolence and peacemaking in our everyday lives 
as well as in going through our political exercises. I could go on and on and on and on. Need I speak of the addiction to war and violence in, that's being perpetrated in Ukraine right now? Or the violence that has people huddled masses, literally to coin a phrase, on the southern border of the United States because people are fleeing from another kind of war that is born of poverty. Who are you? Who am I? Am I only gazing at my own navel? And I'm happy to be a Christian when I'm around you, but I am weak when it comes into speaking into the things that make people's lives a matter literally in a moment of life and death. Now finally this, I hope in our choosing to pick up on Margaret Wheatley's theme that we will choose to be not only the kind of church but the kind of leaders that we can be in this age, that we will make the right choices and to pick up on the language of the apostle, that we will understand the height and the depth and the width and the breadth of the love of God and to understand that we will not do it just through resolutions and recommendations, but only through incarnate embodied communities will we begin to make a difference. Some of the bills that I would support on the hill in Columbus, so to speak, or in Washington, D.C., may never go through, but nothing restricts me from exercising my influence and nothing restricts you from exercising your influence of speaking into a local congregation. Why don't we actually try Jesus and be the church and model and practice ways and means of peacemaking? It's not, there's no some idealistic world in which people never have conflicts. That's not what I'm pleading for. I'm pleading, pleading for us to choose different weaponry if they must be called weapons at all. And may I remind you of what the Apostle Paul said in his second correspondence to the Corinthians. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are not of the flesh, <laughs> but they are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. Why don't we actually try that? Why don't we actually try that? Who would we be and who would we become? So you know where I'm going to end up. It's right on our theme of becoming. I love those words. I'll never tire of them. First John, the first epistle of John, the third chapter, and the first verse and the second. See with what great love God hath loved us, that we should even be called the children of God. And listen to this certitude, and thus, thus we are. That's, that's already, that train has left the station. You are a child of God even if you don't feel like it. I'm a child of God even if I don't act like it. You're a child of God even if you can walk out of here and not speak to you. You're still a child of God. Nothing can unson or undaughter you from the love of God. See with what great love God hath loved us that we should be called the children of God and thus we are. And beloved, it does not yet appear what we shall be. But let me tell you, you, me, all of us together, we have something to say about what it shall appear to be. God's doing the heavy lifting, but we got to get with the God program. <laughs> Jesus has given everything <laughs> and even come back by the hand of a mighty God from the dead but we've got to choose his way. I grew up as a little kid when we were still a segregated church. So sometimes when people think I stand in an idealistic position, haven't seen anything, I can remember when the Methodist church, which is where I started out, was a segregated church constitutionally by the book of discipline. Read your church history, 36 and 39. 
But I used to sit there with my mother and my father might be sitting somewhere else. Sometimes we were all together in the great Tinley Temple United Methodist Church, seating over 3,000 people in the Delaware Annual Conference of the, of the Methodist Church at that time. Now a part of the peninsula, that it, it became, the Delaware became a part of the Peninsula Delaware Conference. And every now and again, somebody would line out a song that would sweep over the room. I, I wish you could hear 3,000 plus African Americans in the 50s and the 60s, and it, that's when I came along. It started before then. And the dignity and the way in which they squared their shoulders back and held their heads up high when they would sing, Beloved, beloved, we are the children of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but this we know, we shall be like him, for we'll see him as he is. So I want you to hear this, worship committee. Before I leave West Ohio, when we're in some great auditorium, I don't care where it is, <laughs> I want somebody to find the, the shape notes. <clears throat> or let me sing it and somebody write it down. So we can teach it to ourselves, but you won't sing it well if you're looking at a piece of paper. Because when they break out, there was no piece of paper. They just said, beloved, beloved, we are the children of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But this we know, we shall be like him. For we'll see him as he is. You may want to work on some of the pronouns, but don't forget the beloved. Don't forget the beloved. Somewhere before I leave here in 20 and 24, I want us to start singing that. It will take the United Methodist Church in West Ohio into an extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary new future to glorify God, to proclaim Jesus Christ, and to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Amen, amen, and amen. I think my job is to dismiss you if, if my colleague Bishop Bickerton is still with us. Your grace, is he still on? Can somebody get him on? I'm gonna have him give us the blessing. You're there, okay. Let's see, can, can we get him up? There he is. Okay, look at that. This somebody's with a handheld, you know. Would you give us the blessing into the evening, Bishop Tom? I sure would. <clears throat> Whenever I give a, a benediction or a blessing around here, I always tell people I have a favorite benediction. And uh, I have been applauding and amening the last 30 or 40 minutes at what is an absolutely remarkable Episcopal address. And I, that's, I'm not blowing any smoke, friends. That's just the best of the best right there. But whenever I give a benediction in New York, I always say, I want to give you my favorite blessing and benediction. So here goes, everyone. All right. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, get out of here. <laughs> get out of here and go to the Capitol. Get out of here and get into the streets. Get out of here and integrate what your bishop has said to you into the way in which we live out the Christian faith in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, get out of here and be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen, amen. and amen. amen. Thank you, dear ones. We are adjourned for the evening. Um, D9 bells we start tomorrow. Look forward to seeing all of you, and we begin with worship. Thank you.